Good evening. Thank you for joining us today with our TIP Talk, Physician Edition. Uh, normally, some of you may or may not know that we have our TIF Talks and it's more for patient education. Today is our first TIF Talk for physicians. Um, it's a perfect opportunity for the physicians to get together and have a conversation and learn more about the TIF procedure. My name is Andrea Millers and I'm the Director of Marketing for Endogastric Solutions. Joining me today is Dr. Kenneth J. Chang. He is from the University of California, Irvine. He is the director of the H.H. H. Chow Comprehensive Digestive Disease Center. He's also the professor and chief of gastroenterology, endowed chair of the GI endoscopic oncology at UC Irvine Health. In, in addition, we have Dr. Nin Nguyen. He is the chief of the division of gastrointestinal surgery and he's also the department chair of surgery. He is also with John Connolly Professor and he's the chair at the University of California Irvine Medical Center. So welcome to the both of you and thank you for being here tonight with us. Thanks, Andrea. You're welcome. We're very excited. We have a great program for you today. Um, Dr. Chang will be discussing why TIF. Um, we'll get to hear Dr. Nguyen's uh, perspective uh, as a surgeon perspective, perspective, if you will, and the importance of collaboration between a surgeon and GI for treating reflux. Um, we'll also have a Q&A session um, that we will be able to answer any questions that you have. Um, so there is a chat section to the right of the uh, live session, and if at any time you guys have a question for the physicians, please go ahead and type it in there, and we will do our best to answer the questions and kind of have an interactive discussion, if you will. So uh, with that said, we're going to go ahead and let Dr. Chang um, start presenting his uh, why tiff uh, presentation. So, Dr. Chang, go ahead and share your screen. All right. Are you seeing my screen now? I do. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I know that this is a, a real crisis time for our nation, for the world, uh, with uh, uh, coronavirus. Uh, and maybe this is a little bit of a break uh, from, from the craziness. Um, I also, you know, took a glance at the uh, registration list. Uh, there are a lot of real experts uh, on the call, uh, so I, we'd love to get your input and, and questions also uh, during the Q&A. So I'll start off by uh, looking at uh, the question, why TIF? Uh, and I'd like to really look at it from a, an anatomical approach, the AAA. Um, so we've all learned to appreciate that GERD is not one, uh, one disease. It's actually a spectrum disorder. Um, and uh, if we look at it from an anatomic spectrum, uh, from the left uh, of the spectrum with a fairly normal anatomy, all the way to the right of the spectrum uh, with anatomic alterations, uh, sliding uh, parasophageal hernia, uh, all of these uh, different profiles actually can present with GERD. So our job as the care providers is to, to see where the patient fits in in the GERD spectrum and really try to individualize the patient's care towards where they are uh, in, in, the, in the spectrum disorder. So one of the things that we've come to understand recently is that uh, there's more than one valve. Uh, we've always uh, talked about the LES, the LES, the LES, um, but uh, now when we talk to patients, we say, look, we, you know, there are really two valves that we need to think about uh, that, that prevent acid from splashing into your esophagus. We need to look at the inside valve and we need to look at the outside valve. Uh, the outside valve being the, the cura, the, the, the right cura of the diaphragm. Now the inside valve is the lower esophageal sphincter and even the LES uh, we've come to learn some new things in the last decade. And one of the things that we've learned is that the lower esophageal sphincter is actually more than just in the esophagus, uh, that it starts in the distal esophagus uh, with this uh, circular muscle. And uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ravi Mittal's group has well demonstrated 
that these uh, circular muscles in the distal esophagus are, are, are in contiguity uh, with the sling fibers in the proximal stomach. So there's a part of the LES that's actually into the, the uh, proximal stomach. And so we, we want to be considerate of that as we talk about why TIF as well. So, so uh, more on this. When we, when we uh, do an endoscopy and, and retroflex and, uh, and look at the G-junction, we commonly see uh, this uh, structure here. And this, uh, this structure here actually represents these sling fibers, which, as we talked about, are in continuity with the circular inner fibers of the esophagus. And when the sling fibers are, are nice and tight and taut, they produce this nice angle called the angle of his. Uh, here we see that the angle of his is slightly uh, blunted. Uh, it's not a sharp incline. Uh, when we do the TIF procedure, uh, transoral incisionless fundal plication, we have the opportunity of actually remodeling uh, the sling fibers, which is the stomach part of the LES, and it looks like this. So you can see here now, after the TIF procedure, we've uh, elongated uh, the uh, this uh, uh, lower part of the LES, we've created a lengthy flap valve, uh, which is a very important mechanism uh, for anti-reflux. Um, so, so LES and sling fibers. Uh, so more to take uh, to bring this home. Here is a, 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 a picture of the uh, lack of that uh, uh, flap valve. Um, th there's no angle of hiss on, the, on that left side, uh, but here on the right side, uh, we can see the normal uh, flap valve that not only is there length, not only is there a narrowing, uh, but it will flap close when acid is trying to splash back up. It will actually create a closure rather than allowing uh, the acid to come up into the esophagus because of the angle and the floppiness of the valve. All right, so we talked about LES and what we've learned. Uh, let's uh, focus then on the outside valve, uh, the, the crura. So this is a nice schematic of the uh, right crus. This is the right bundle of the right crus that uh, envelops the esophagus. And then you have the left bundle of the right crus. Both the right and the left bundle originate on the right side. So it's all right crus that um, envelops or, or circles the, the G junction and attaches to the vertebral column on the right side. Uh, this acts as a noose or a sling uh, to accentuate that angle and actually uh, pull down and, and posteriorly uh, 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 tug on the G junction to provide that closure. So more on this. Uh, so this is uh, Ravi Mittal's group again, showing a very nice uh, study. Uh, here in, in, in red is the right cruz attached to the spine, and it, uh, it circles and wraps around the G-junction, uh, again, like acting as a noose. So when, when it pulls and tightens, it act, it's actually bringing uh, the G-junction slightly posteriorly, and then this in this uh, schematic, you see it's actually pulling uh, inferiorly. So it's pulling inferiorly and to the right to cause this uh, this uh, strangulation almost. It's almost like the um, uh, uh, rectalis uh, pubis rectalis uh, pulling uh, to to create the uh, the, the uh, control of continence. So so uh, we're learning a lot more about the cura and its function, and it's quite dynamic. It's not merely this passive thing that prevents the stomach from sliding up. It actually uh, is much more uh, complicated and intricate than that. So we're learning more of, of the importance of the outside valve in addition to the LES. Uh, so more on this. This is the uh, Ebarostat uh, balloon that is radio-opaque, and it's, uh, it's um, placed right at that G-junction. And you can see the angle is almost a... Uh, a right, right angle turn almost looks like the uh, hockey stick. And that angle is caused, uh, created by that right crura uh, pulling and creating the sling or noose effect. 
In patients with GERD, even without a hiatal hernia, what we would typically see is that the angle is now uh, not as sharp. It's more obtuse, not as acute. And that's because the sling is now more loose and, uh, and therefore uh, it, it doesn't have that sharp angle. And in patients with GERD and a hiatal hernia, that angle is almost non-existent. It's a straight shot uh, because now it's loose and the stomach can freely slide uh, up into the thorax. Uh, so the right cruise really does act like a sling on the G-junction. And this is work by John Panolfino and, 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 and the Northwestern group. Um, so again, when we consider the patient and individualized care, we talk about three potential anti-reflux components that we need to assess before embarking on treatment. We need to ask, does this patient need a hernia to be reduced uh, or lengthening of the intra-abdominal esophagus? Secondly, does the cura need to be tightened? Does that sling function need to be restored? And thirdly, does the LES need to be augmented to recreate the original flap valve? Uh, and whether that's laparoscopic or endoscopic, uh, we can look at each of these components uh, separately. Obviously, the first two components can only be uh, addressed uh, laparoscopically or surgically. The third component could be addressed either laparoscopically or endoscopically. Uh, so, sorry for this quadratic equation, but I'll blame Peter Kirillis for this one. So, uh, Dr. Kirillis has looked at what, what really uh, constitute or, or impacts or influences the, the volume of reflux. Uh, and uh, don't, don't, don't go bleary-eyed with the equation, but basically, it's the diameter that's critically important to the fourth power, and then the length of the EGJ. So diameter and length are very important to determine how much reflux volume occurs. So this is for this is for the simple simple folks like myself who can rather look at a cartoon. And so this is this is someone underwater breathing out of a straw. The straw is narrow and long and that flow is very limited compared to this straw which is short and wide. A short and wide straw, this person would be breathing fairly normally. A, a narrow and long straw, they would be turning blue underwater because they can't get enough flow. So when we try, when we talk about anti-reflux across the valve, we're trying to create a longer, narrower straw. And back to the equation, if we plug in some numbers, if we just change the diameter of the valve by four millimeters and increase the length of the valve by two centimeters, we're decreasing the flow tremendously. And that's our goal at the LES is to create some narrowing and some lengthening. So now how do we approach the patient? What are the options? Well, if the patient can repair, uh, they can do uh, a, a traditional uh, hernia repair plus total fundal plication, that's the Nissen. Hernia repair plus the, augment, uh, the magnetic augmentation, that's Lynx. Hernia repair plus a partial fundal plication, uh, toupee or door, and these are all laparoscopic. If all they need is the, the valve to be reconstructed, uh, they can do a strata procedure, they can do the esophic stiff procedure, which we'll talk about more. Uh, also, there's a, a new strategy, and, and those who need hernia repair can have their hernia repair plus TIF uh, in a concomitant procedure, which we'll talk about as well. So these are currently the options available. So where's the, uh, where on the spectrum is my patient? We'll start with an endoscopy. We want to look for the hiatal hernia. Uh, we want to assess the hill grade or the diaphragmatic hiatus, which speaks to the width of that straw. The hiatal hernia is the length of the straw. Um, then we want to look for telltale signs of uh, high acid exposure with the presence of esophagitis, LA classification, and the presence of Barrett's also indicates uh, a prolonged acid exposure. Um, then we do a pH study, and typically we do this with the wireless pH 
And we want to determine whether the patient could be in the subset of upright predominant reflux versus supine. We want to look at the total acid exposure time. Uh, and we want to look at the Demista score uh, to look at severity of acid reflux. Uh, in, in select patients, we'll also combine that with the endoflip, uh, which looks at motility and for the most part can rule out achalasia, which can sometimes fool us. Uh, presenting as a GERD patient. Uh, so if a patient uh, is suspected to have a, a more advanced anatomy, a Hill grade three or more, we may just include the endoflip uh, for a one-stop shop workup, uh, which would be uh, more efficient. Manometry is still quite standard, but only on select patients if we're considering an, an, an endoscopic approach only. It's not required for the TIF procedure uh, but oftentimes uh, we use it when we are uh, doing a more uh, formal uh, hernia repair. Now, the endoflip has uh, taken over a lot of that, uh, but manometry on select patients with uh, history of dysphagia. So again, we want to look at the vertical, ex vertical extent of the hernia, and we're all very familiar with that. Uh, what we're not as good at, uh, and that's globally not as good at, um, we're not very good at looking at the at the excursion, the width or the the thickness of the straw, so to speak, uh, with the hill grade. So just to refresh everyone, this is a hill grade one where a retroflex view shows the G junction is snug and tight around the scope. Hill grade two, you see there is some opening, some laxity, especially with some uh, air or CO2 provocation. The hill grade three, it's really open and patchless, and you can envision multiple scopes fitting in that same space. And hill grade four uh, also includes a vertical excursion of the G junction up into the thorax. So that's by definition, including a hiatal hernia. So I want to show you this uh, brief video, um, and let me turn the volume down here, just in case you miss work because of coronavirus. Uh, anyway, um, so here on the retroflex view, initially, if you only spend a few seconds, which normally we, that's all we spend, uh, it looks like a hill grade wine. It looks like fine, it's intact, you know, it's snug around the scope. What we've learned is that if we stay in this position for 60 seconds, and continue to, uh, to insufflate with CO2, uh, we often will get surprised at, at uh, the change that happens between 30 and 60 seconds. Uh, so we've been watching now for about 20 seconds. Um, and here we're seeing it opening up a little bit and we're about 30 seconds in now. Now we're at 35 seconds, now we're at 40 seconds. Um, now we're at 50 seconds, 55 seconds. Here at 60 seconds, you can see that's a very different anatomy than when we first started. That's a cl clear hill grade three. And an endoscopic uh, approach will not suffice in this patient. So that's a common you know, um, pitfall for us. We underestimate the hill grade, really underestimate the hill grade. All right. Um, now, sometimes we can get fooled, not because we don't give, give enough CO2, but in this case, um, we, we see that the hill grade looks like a 1-2, but when we take the patient laparoscopically, uh, so this is uh, Nin and I working together, and he pulls out this gob of fat, this fat pad that can kind of live at the G-junction and take up space in an otherwise very loose open hiatus. Uh, but endoscopically, this fat pad is compressing and it doesn't show you the hill grade that is actually there. So that can be a, uh, a bit of a pitfall as well. Okay, uh, so with the workup, this is the Bravo pH, which uh, everyone's quite familiar with. Um, and again, we, we like to do as much as possible a GERD one-stop shop workup. Uh, endoscopy, looking at the hill grade, looking for the hernia. Endoflip to make sure it's not uh, achalasia, and uh, this is the secondary peristalsis, which is quite normal. It's it's like a manometry that you can actually do when the patient's sedated. Um, it's a secondary peristalsis, and then we uh, place the Bravo 
uh, and do a typically a 48 hours, sometimes a 96 hour, and and that's the 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 workup. That's uh, it's all the workup that most of these uh, patients need, and then we can look at where they fit in 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 terms of the GERD spectrum. So here, for example, on endoscopy is a fairly normal, you know, Hill grade one, and we put the pH probe in, and the, this patient is an exclusive daytime refluxer. At night, they don't reflux at all, and they don't have esophagitis. So this patient really just needs a valve augment, uh, augmentation. They don't need a hernia repair per se. Here's a patient who's got a Hill grade two. Uh, their LES may be slightly weak, uh, slightly open hiatus, uh, and they have daytime and nighttime reflux, uh, maybe LAA esophagitis. These folks are also within range of an endoscopic approach, uh, and that's with the TIF uh, esophix uh, device. Uh, further on in the spectrum, this is a patient with an obvious hernia and a Hill grade four. These patients uh, should have a laparoscopic hernia repair. And that can be uh, combined with the traditional uh, complete or total fundal plication or Nissen, uh, or the uh, sphincter augmentation with uh, the uh, magnetic device links, or now a combination of the hernia repair plus TIF. So more on TIF. Uh, this is a schematic showing the TIF device uh, retracting on the G junction. Uh, creating about a three centimeter flat valve uh, that's composed of the esophagus on the inside and stomach on the outside, just uh, pulling, retracting, and then using these H fasteners to couple and cause tissue adhesion uh, to hold that uh, structure in place for uh, years to come. Uh, this is what the uh, actual valve looks like after the TIF procedure. So it's a three centimeter uh, length valve. Sometimes we can get four and about a 270, sometimes up to 300 degree um, uh, fundal plication. So this is just the animation on the TIF procedure. You've probably uh, seen this um, on the website and so on. Uh, the device is retroflexed and uh, the uh, helical retractor is used to uh, secure that angle at the G junction, uh, once it's secured, uh, it's a retraction movement, creating the valve length. That's how the valve length is created. And um, uh, with these uh, suction ports, we can also push the G junction down and then uh, safely fire these uh, H-shaped fasteners uh, to create that adhesion and, and collagen deposition. So over time, this fibroelastic uh, tissue that uh, creates adhesion on the serosal side, and this uh, creates a, a durable uh, three centimeter valve. Now, one difference between a TIF uh, valve um, and a uh, traditional fund application, and that is really that the fundus of the stomach is spared with the TIF, because here we're just uh, retracting and uh, umbricating the G junction and fastening it, we're not utilizing much of the actual gastric fundus, uh, which is important for accommodation. A and that may account for some of the decreased post-op uh, symptoms that, that we uh, don't see after the TIF procedure because we, we're not losing the, the fundus accommodation. Uh, we're creating a true flat valve. So again, to summarize the anatomy, uh, what we're doing is we're uh, augmenting and reinforcing the sling fibers, uh, making that uh, angle of his cardio notch steeper, uh, creating length and uh, decreased diameter uh, of that straw or flap valve. Uh, so finally, I wanna show you this video. Uh, this is a video that shows both the laparoscopic and the TIF portion we're doing a lot of these in combination. I'm gonna skip through the beginning of the video because that's the, uh, I don't wanna steal any of Nin's thunder. Uh, this is a patient with a GERD and a, and a three centimeter hernia. Uh, and this is the baseline uh, endoscopy. So I'm gonna zip through uh, Nin's part. He's gonna show you that more in, in a few seconds. But I'm gonna start right here and show you the TIF portion.
which is the same whether I'm doing this alone or in combination. Is it? Oh, it's, it's, it's going nicely here. Okay, yeah, so I'm here we're the placing the device in, so and following. then uh, rotating okay, to the second. posterior right, uh, aspect, before. retracting okay, and uh, turning into the corner, okay, and then fire. activating the trigger handle to yeah. place the, the fasteners. Is, uh, typically three now. on the posterior side. The now go to the nicely. anterior side, and uh, three there, and then go to five o'clock. And then two bites there, seven o'clock, two more bites more. there. And then I'm doing some touch up, um, going back anteriorly. Uh, so typically uh, about 16 Here's bites or 30 semi fasteners. Like the valve, Nin? And here I'm asking Nin if he's pleased with the valve. Real valve. And this is for the patient, it's just a high pressure zone. Right. It's not a valve. Right. It's just a high pressure zone. This is your create, recreating the valve. You know, Ooh, that's that's a million dollar quote right there. Yeah, so that's the million dollar <laughs> quote from Nin, and this is the pre on the right and the post on the left. Um, so with that, I'll I'll finish with uh, you know one slide on you know what's the expected efficacy. So these are all the level one uh, trials. These are multi-center randomized uh, control trial. Uh, in summary, seventy-two to eighty-eight percent of patients can eliminate troublesome regurgitation um, and be off their PPIs. Uh, and the durability from the TEMPO trial uh, looks uh, sustainable out to five years. Um, and so it's a very reasonable um, durability. Um, we have some preliminary beyond five years, but I think uh, five years we can, we can be confident about. Uh, Safety-wise, um, there have been 25,000 of these procedures performed since 20, uh, 2008. Uh, according to the MAO database, which is the reported SAEs, uh, the, the adverse event rate is 0.36%. Uh, SAEs looking at two meta-analyses range from 2 to 2.5%. SAEs from the four randomized control trials, which actually follow the patients prospectively and actually actively collect a, a, a adverse events, looked at a 0.5% uh, SAE rate. Uh, the complications are uh, on the slide. The, uh, the more uh, worrisome complications, esophageal perforations and lacerations occurred early on uh, since in the early stages of the, of the uh, technology. We have not seen that, uh, I would say, in the last uh, four or five years. Uh, with the newest uh, um, techniques and the newest iterations of the device. Uh, this is the last slide summarizing the efficacy, clinical benefits, 78 to 93 percent uh, symptoms-wise, off PPI, 78 to 81 percent, esophagitis healed, 80 to 84 percent, normalization of pH between 60 and this is the combined uh, up to 95 percent with the combined uh, hernia repair. Uh, the other thing that's notable is that the long-term side effect profile comparing either TIF alone or TIF in combination with a hernia repair compared to traditional anti-reflux surgery uh, appears to be less. Uh, there's been no real uh, long-term side effects of dysphagia, gas, low flatulence, or diarrhea with the TIF procedure. So with that, I, I I went a little bit over, maybe five minutes over, so sorry, Nin, but uh, I want to be able to um, turn turn the uh, podium to Andrea and then to Dr. Nin Nguyen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chang. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions that I might have you um, answer while we get uh, Dr. Nguyen's uh, presentation ready. So uh, we have a question from Kasum Stokes. Uh, the question is, should 60 seconds re retroflexion be routine for hill classification? Yeah, I, I would say yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's time, but, um, you know, j just like a lot of things in endoscopy, if you're if you're looking for dysplasia in Barris, you, you can't do it in 15 seconds, right? It, someone said whatever, 10 seconds per centimeter or whatever, but I think the 60 second rule, uh, in my experience, has been really helpful uh, to to give it enough time 
and enough build up a, a, enough um, distension to sure. really show what's going on. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Anton Jackie. Thanks for the nice presentation. In a patient with GERD symptoms, despite taking high dose PPIs, would you do 24 hours esophageal pH with impedance instead of Bravo to check for non-acid reflux? Yeah, so if they have a partial response to PPI and the thought of coming off uh, creates great anxiety for the patient, then the pH impedance is, is perfect. Uh, we can measure the total amount of reflux and also look for non-acid reflux. Um, okay. Wonderful, thank you. We do have another question, but I'm gonna go ahead and let Dr. Nguyen start his presentation and we'll get back to the questions. Please uh, feel free to keep asking questions and uh, after Dr. Nguyen's um, presentation, we'll open it up for a Q&A so you guys can continue to have some dialogue. So uh, Dr. Nguyen, take it away. Thank you, Andrea. So um, I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to try to run through this, you know, relatively quick so we can actually get to the question and answer sessions to maybe can answer some of your questions. So my goal today is really to give you a surgeon's perspective on um, this whole concept of laparoscopic hydrocarbon repair in combination with a transoral incisionless fundoplication, otherwise known as concomitant TIF, uh, otherwise known as CTIF. And I think... I mean, the answer is that why would we do this? Um, you know, lapnison is a good operation. Uh, it might, you know, have long-term side effects, including dysphagia and gas bloat, but there's also the laparoscopic partial fundoplication that you can also do. Uh, the fundoplication only adds about 30 minutes to the operation. Um, some of us takes down the short gastric vessel, which require a little bit more time, and some of us do not. So why provide a TIF in combination with the hiatal. So I'm going to try to run through these. These are some of the points. Um, you know, the first thing everybody kind of know about me is that I am adverse to complication. So whatever I do has to have an excellent safety profile. And my initial impression of lap hiatal hernia with TIF is, is, is that exactly, um, I know the data on TIF and I know that Ken Chang and various other uh, leader in this field has been doing TIF for a long time now and getting good re result. But the question is adding a TIF to a laparoscopic hernia. are you maintaining that safety profile? So we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, Ken already mentioned that this is a true flat valve or a true anti-reflux valve and why I think that is. Um, a little bit on why C-TIF improves the outcome of TIF alone. Uh, the main answer is that the main reason for failure of TIF currently as primary procedure, either the presence of a hydro hernia that was undetected or development of a hydro hernia. So those are the primary reason. My thoughts are primarily these hydro hernia were under-recognized rather than development of these hydro hernia at a later date. And last but not least, I think there is this impression of the patient and GI physician with regarding to the lap Nissen. Um, my my it be uh, the lap Nissen having a bad rap. Um, uh, in some respect, it is, um, you know, uh, and we'll do a bit why TIF has improved the acceptance by the patient as a GI physician. So when these patients come to see me uh, about uh, hydro hernia repair with TIF, I go through the process of discussing the pros and cons of lap Nissen, lap partial fundification and CTIF, but I can tell you that majority of the patient already have made their mind even prior to walk into our office for the discussion on the pros and cons, and, and, and majority of time is leaning towards the uh, TIF. So the first several cases, I do have concern. Um, remember, we mobilize the esophagus, the stomach, some to take down the short gastric vessel, so the question is that if you blow up the stomach, uh, will there be bleeding along the short gastric vessel? So in the first several cases, we, I actually left the port in place and actually evaluate the esophagus and, and the entire area, submerge it under the water, make sure that everything's okay. After those several cases, I essentially patient. So at the current state, 
state, we do not leave the ports in place. So once we complete our laparoscopic hydrohernia repair, and I always try to joke with Ken Chang to see who actually complete their portion of the operation a little bit quicker. Uh, normally, I give him about 45 minutes, uh, and, and normally um, he cannot meet that deadline. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, the first 10 cases, I stay in the room and evaluate exactly everything that Ken Cheng's doing. No matter what, it boils down to it, this, this is my patient. Uh, when I take a patient to the room, it's truly, you know, uh, this, this is my patient. So uh, I really watch it because, you know, with TIF, it's a little bit different. Um, you, we haven't mobilized a lot of the, uh, you know, frenoesophageal ligament, uh, skeletonized the esophagus, etc. So, you know, could there be higher risk with CETA? So, uh, what are these risks? Meaning instrumentation, placement of the bougie, placement of the medical of the device itself, uh, etc. So, um, after about ten cases, I felt very comfortable with regard to the safety profile, and I'll, we'll go over some of our initial data on the safety profile of CTIF. So which procedure is best? Is it the lap hider hernia plus Nissen or lap hider hernia plus TIF? And then if you talk about efficacy debatable, I think uh, at the end, likely there's going to be close to equivalence or at least equivalence in terms of efficacy but certainly we believe that there is lower long-term side effects such as gas bloat, the gas bloat or dysphagia symptom. And, you know, we do have to bring up the caveat, uh, you know, with regarding to that in, uh, increased risk uh, related to introduction of the device. I think you have to be concerned about that. Uh, certainly I believe, you know, uh, that you need to pass the learning curve of TIF prior to trying to perform a C-TIF. Uh, remember that when Ken Chang approached me, uh, to, to do this combined uh, procedure here. He already have done 200 TIF procedure as primary procedure. So certainly he already passed his own learning curve uh, for that. So I felt very confident with that. Uh, initially, we avoided reoperative surgery, but currently we're actually also doing reoperative surgery. So meaning if a patient already have a TIF and then develop a hydrohernia, we'll go ahead and uh, re repair the hydrohernia and redo the TIF uh, also. Uh, certainly, uh, from a surgeon's perspective here, uh, we do have to be careful, particularly if you're going to take down short gastric vessel. Uh, I don't take down the short gastric vessel in, in every case, but certain cases I do need to take it down to get a good repair. And if that's the case, I pay attention to minimize post-operative bleeding. So this is how it works now. So for the combined procedure, I finished my portion and then I actually leave the room now. I don't stay in there anymore. I feel very confident in this. Um, we have enough uh, number of cases uh, to say that this is a safe operation now. And as you can see here, after every single case, Ken, Ken would actually take a picture of the, the actual valve. Here is just an example of the text. And then uh, he sent it to me, uh, letting me know that he completed his portion of the procedure. Uh, this is a couple of publications showing the safety pro profile, 55 patient, no complication. Uh, mean follow-up of eight months. Uh, uh, you can see that the GERD uh, HRQL reduced from 33 to 9. The reflux uh, um, uh, symptom uh, index reduced from 20 to 8. Um, another publication um, of 99 uh, patient underwent CTIF, no complication uh, reported, uh, and the uh, uh, GERD HRQL improved by 17 points. This is an abstract that uh, we submitted to DDW um, uh, since the meeting was canceled. Uh, uh, this was not presented, but 25 patients here. Uh, we did have one GI bleed. Uh, this patient, the reason we know about the GI bleed is the patient complained of melanotic stool, uh, but no transfusion was required. Uh, as you can see there, the GERD um, uh, HRQL regurgitation uh, reduced from 10 to approximately 2, and GERD HRQL heartburn severity decreased from 15 to 2.8. 76% uh, were off of PPI. So I do have to say that uh, 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 you could get paradox gas bloat. And if you can take a look at the picture that Ken Chang kind of showed you, that looks like a very robust valve. But that valve's not going to look like that in three months from now. 
uh, with all the edema associated with construction of that valve, these patients will occasionally complain of gas bloat symptom. So with regarding to safety, certainly I would say you have to pass the learning curve for TIF. Whatever it might be, if for you it's 10 cases, then that's what it is. But some of you might take longer than 10 cases. Um, again, if I require to take down short gastric vessel, I certainly pay attention to make sure that it's hemostatic. Uh, and certainly, if there's any reoperative setting, particularly when you combine a uh, procedure like links removal, I tend not to add in the TIF. I tend to uh, perform an anti-reflux operation such as uh, partial fundoplication after removal of the links. Um, we believe maybe providing a better anti-reflux valve, and I think Ken Chang already alluded to, so if you ask a biomedical uh, engineering student to, to come up with the best anti-reflux valve, what they're going to come up with, what you look, uh, you can see here, which is a flat valve. The Nissen fundoplication is a flat valve but it's constructed in a different way. It's a physiologic flat valve. And maybe it's too good. And you know the data to show that it's really a super physiologic flat valve, or hence uh, difficulty in gas bloat and also uh, dysphagia symptom. Um, we also believe that CTIF improves the outcome of the TIF alone. And, and the reason for that is really that underappreciation of the extent of the hider uh, hernia defect. And I think Ken Chang already alluded to of how you can actually improve on the detection of a hider hernia uh, using the endoscopic approach. But also we use an upper GI to detect these hider hernia also. Uh, but I think be a combination uh, between uh, a endoscopic evaluation and um, an upper GI, because certainly an upper GI can also miss a hiatal defect. And I can tell you that no radiologist can uh, decipher for me if it's a sliding hiatal hernia or a parasophageal hiatal hernia. They tend not to do that on their own report here. I'm just giving you an example here of a patient that was uh, described as a three sonomy hiatal hernia. So that's on the left side here, and that was read by an upper GI. And if you look at that, you says, hey, maybe that is hiding hydrogen because if you can see the G junction is up here, and, and as you can see, there's really no uh, gastric component above that. But I can tell you, if you put the laparoscope here, look at this defect. This is the exact same patient. The only reason you can actually see this defect here for, is really for us to reduce the hernia where the gastric fundus was herniated up in the uh, mediastinum here. So certainly this is a parasophageal hiatal hernia. And this is a upper GI study demonstrating the construction of a flap valve and also the construction of the secondary valve, which is the crura, which is repair of the crura, as you can see here. Here's the diaphragm. We increase in the intra-abdominal esophageal length. Everybody think that, hey, all we do is just repair the hiatus and repair the crura. That is not true. The biggest component of a hiatal repair is increase in intra-abdominal esophageal length to create this valve. Without us mobilizing, extending into the mediastinum, pulling the esophagus down here, I can tell you that Ken Chang would not be able to build such a valve to make it look like this and gave you that very elaborate flow equation. And that's exactly what you want, right? You want a narrow channel and you want actually creating this flap when the, uh, the content within the stomach flap against the actual valve preventing the reflux here. And then last but not least is really who's the patient and GI physician acceptance, you know, of an anti-reflux procedure. So if, if, if you ask me what's the optimal anti-reflux operation, well, I would have to say it has to have excellent efficacy, excellent safety profile, low side effect. But also, if you have such a good operation, but you don't have a patient acceptance, then it, it really doesn't help that much. And I think somewhat the lap Nissen has that bad rap and not being accepted by our patient and even our GI colleague here. So this is the prevalence of anti-reflux operation, you know, in the nation. So 40 million 
uh, gastroenterologic reflux disease uh, patient here. And if you think about maybe one, 25% of, of those patients has severe disease and uh, severe by severe disease, I mean it, it impair one's quality of life here. Uh, currently, we perform 20,000 anti-reflux procedure. So if you think that this anti-reflux operation is the most effective therapy, that we're providing the most effective therapy for less than 0.2% of the eligible patient. So we're not really helping a lot of the patient here. And that data came from this um, publication here in Surgical Endoscopy, described that in 2005, there are approximately 15,000 anti-reflux operations that increased to only about 19,000. And despite having a great safety profile of the lap Nissen, where the mortality has declined more than 50%. So the conclusion of this paper is that a distant no research is needed to understand why is that the anti-reflux surgery is being underutilized. And despite you know, being underutilized, we know the long-term side effects of PPIs and everybody's on PPIs. And you can see here, I'm not going through this list, but you can see for yourself, there's significant long-term side effects associated with PPIs. To pay your attention to looking at GERD as a disease in comparison, morbid obesity as a disease. These two diseases are highly prevalent. One third of Americans are severely obese. Medical management is the mainstay for, for, uh, uh, for GERD, but does not control regurgitation or non-acid reflux. Medical management is the mainstay uh, treatment for morbid obesity, but they're high risk at long-term follow-up. So if you think about it, we have a good operation, that's called the laparoscopic Nissen for fundification, which we consider as the gold standard, but it's truly being underutilized. Bariatric surgery was similar to that phenomenon where it was only about 0.2%, but now we have moved the needle whereby we're performing about 1% uh, uh, of the eligible patient population. So this is a graph of our group uh, looking at how bariatric procedure compared to anti-reflux operation. In 1995, that's when the laparoscopic approach to anti-reflux come onto line. They increase it, but not by much. You're, you're increasing about from 10,000 to about 20,000 operations per year. However, if you look at bariatric surgery, there was an exponential growth. Currently, we're doing about 220,000 uh, bariatric pr procedure per year. Despite having an excellent safety profile for both operations, look at bariatric surgery here and look at, at anti-reflux, very similar in terms of safety profile. So we changed the way we thinking about bariatric surgery. Instead of fighting with each other that says, which procedure is best? Is it the bypass? Is this the sleeve? Now we change our attention to, to, to think how to provide more effective therapy to more patients. How can we move the needle? And certainly one of the ways we can move the needle in, in, th in this approach is really collaboration between the GI surgeon and the gastroenterologist. And, and essentially, this is more of a team approach to reflux. So our entire team here offer a, a spectrum of management from either endoscopic alternative to a combination, meaning CTIF to reoperative surgery and even root and white gastric bypass. It's essentially one-stop shop for management of reflux here. I think this will provide benefit for the patient who otherwise would not even know about the surgical option that can potentially get them off of medical therapy. It also stimulate innovation and improve collaboration between us and the gastroenterologists for other disease process here. So this is the transition of my practice. Majority of my practice prior to doing this collaborative work in relationship with um, Ken Cheng on CTIF here is primarily giant hiatal. And, and you can see the picture there. These are truly giant hiatal. And why? Because most of the small hiatal really never come to my practice. I think this is, I'm transitioning to a different kind of practice, smaller hiatal hernia here, uh, and working collaboratively with um, Ken Cheng. Shown real quick. I'm not going to belabor the point, but just to show you that this patient was identified was to have a two centimeter hiatal hernia. And I want you to look at this laparoscopic view and tell me how a two centimeter was identified. The way you describe a two centimeter hiatal hernia was based on a vertical length. 
there was never mention of the width. Okay, that's what it means right there. When I actually put my instrument in, that's the width of the crura. Okay, and that is based on the hill grade analysis, and that's exactly what Ken Chang was talking about. And this is a very gigantic width, despite a two centimeter vertical height. That is the difference, and this is a dynamic area where the cardia can herniate in, in and out, in and out. And you can see that when I kind of try to replicate kind of movement. Just fast forward real quick to the actual repair. And part of the repair is intra-esophageal length. And you can see that now we have literally more, more than three centimeter esophagus. That's critical. And you need to have that to create a robust anti-reflux valve. I think the combination of health and Ken Cheng does make a better valve because we increase in the intra-abdominal length. So this is an example of a pre-hernia. And then I would, this is the post-hernia repair, as you can see here, which is, which is a hill grade one. Again, hill grade three, convert to a hill grade one immediately after the repair. And then a hill grade one after the repair, convert into a C-tip. And you can see the C-tip valve right there. And this valve, like I said previously, will loosen over time. But in the perioperative period, it is tight. It's like a Nissen. It's edema associated with some patient will complain of gas blow in the perioperative period. And again, pre-hernia, hill grade three, hill grade one, and you can see here the post-tip procedure. And this shows you the upper GI before and after here. And similarly, you gotta be very careful. If you think about it, if you read this, some people might call this a, a sliding hiatal. That is not the case. Whenever you see the tortuosity of the esophagus right here, there is always a parasophageal component. It just does not identify. You have to look at various view to actually identify the parasophageal component to this. So do not think that this is a sliding hiatal uh, hernia by itself because you've seen the G-junction is here. And you can see here what Ken again alluded to that once we finish this TIF valve, there is a very long, narrow, flat valve. And by increase in the intra-abdominal length, you can create a longer valve. As you can see here, this valve is, uh, I, I'm, I didn't truly measure this, but I would say it might be a little bit more than three centimeters. Uh, just another uh, uh, visualization, endoscopic view shown post hernia. Uh, this is the uh, construction of the valve itself, and, and this is completion of the valve itself. So I just want to conclude that I think we know now, besides just the LES, the crew plays an integral component to GERD pathophysiology. The present hydro hernia is really highly under-recognized and under-appreciated. I think we're appreciating it much more now than previously. I think control GERD and do it in high efficacy, you do have to make sure that you repair the hiatal, uh, but also construct an anti-reflux valve. The utilization of lapnison is low. I would say currently it's about 0.1 or 0.2%. Uh, <clears throat> CTIF is a safe and effective alternative to lapnison and improves the patient acceptance for an effective surgical approach when compared to the mainstay medical therapy. I think it is a really good platform for working relationship between uh, the GI surgeon and the gastro uh, gastroenterologist, a multidisciplinary team approach to reflux. And, and certainly, I think that will likely increase the penetrance of anti-reflux procedure. And last but not least, I think we do need a, an RCT that's necessary to really elucidate the efficacy and long-term side effects differences between CTIF and lapnison. I just want to thank you, everybody, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Nguyen, uh, and both, both of you. Um, this is great. We've got a lot of questions that have come up, so hopefully you guys can uh, withstand all the questions that we've got coming up, but I'm going to go through some of them. Uh, let's see here. First of all, from 
Yanni Papa, uh, any experience using TIF in patients with reflux and ineffective esophageal motility and or delayed gastric empty emptying? Yeah, so I, I can take that. Uh, so that's a very common scenario where a patient had manometry and showed ineffective esophageal peristalsis. Uh, those patients may have a relative uh, contraindication to a full uh, 360 wrap, uh, but uh, TIF is 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 quite safe in those patients in terms of not creating dysphagia uh, because it's a 270-300 degree uh, fund application. So uh, that's a very common scenario uh, that will that we do routinely. Um, for ineffective, what was the second part? Uh, gastroparesis or? Uh, delayed delayed gastric, gastric, yeah, delayed yeah, gastric. Delayed gastric emptying. Right. Yeah, so th that that could be an issue, because obviously if the stomach is delayed in emptying, uh, they're more likely to reflux. Um, depending on the patient's symptoms, if they suffer nausea, vomiting, we may address that first and do the workup, uh, maybe Botox, pylorus, and go to G poem first, and then go back and take care of the GERD. But if there's if it's not really symptomatic, uh, we don't think that this procedure will make uh, delayed gastric emptying necessarily worse. Uh, but we're always cognizant of how the interplay between the two. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Lokesh Jha. Why does long-term success of PPIs decrease over the time? Is that due to underestimate uh, underestimation of hill grade? Long-term effect of PPI. Why, why are we seeing a diminution of long of PPI use? Or right. PPI of efficacy. Uh, he says long-term. He doesn't say efficacy, but I'm assuming that's probably what he's asking. Why does it decrease over time? Is it due to the um, underestimation of uh, hill grade? Well, yeah, I mean, um, PPIs work by neutralizing acid. So if there's non-acid reflux, that could certainly be uh, causing increased symptoms. Uh, patients who previously have been 80, 90% controlled on PPI may come in now saying it's at best 50 to 60%. And it could be now there's a there's more of a non-acid component to their reflux. Okay. Right. Um, in in addition to to that, uh, can um, regurgitation doesn't really control with PPI, and that's a big issue right there. Um, a lot of the patient get confused uh, in terms of regarding their symptom. A lot of their symptom is regurgitation itself. They continue to have that regurgitative symptom. And right. that trial has already been done. Uh, that's the magnetic uh, sphincter augmentation trial compared mm -hmm. to PPI itself. And uh, patients on PPI do not have good control of regurgitation at all. And, and also, there's also a component of uh, esophageal hypersensitivity. Uh, these patients have non-acid reflux, and they are very sensitive to that nature and will continue to have symptoms. Right. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, next question, let's see, uh, from Shazad Iqbal, what's the protocol for TIF in patients with Barrett's esophagus? Great, uh, great question. So, in patients with Barrett's esophagus, with any dysplasia, uh, we would want to treat that first. Uh, so, whether it's RFA, EMR, cryo, spray cryo, balloon cryo, we try to get them to crim or complete resolution of the intestinal plasia before embarking on any anti-reflux. The caveat is if they're being refractory to treatment of Barrett's, then we may want to consider anti-reflux and then finish with the ablation. But most of the time, we try to get rid of the dysplasia first. A bit different from that is a patient with low-risk Barrett's, you know, uh, irregular Z-line, non-dysplastic Barrett's, suffering from GERD, in those patients, we'll, we'll do the TIF or C-TIF, and uh, it doesn't uh, hamper the, the uh, surveillance endoscopy afterwards, nor does it really hamper um, uh, the treatment uh, if treatment is necessary down the road. Um, you certainly don't want to do RFA over a newly placed 
uh, tip fastener. Uh, if you really needed to do something that soon, I would probably go with cryo that can treat even uh, on and over the tiny little fasteners. Can I mention a little bit about the side effects of RFA? Um, I don't even remember that case, Ken, but RFA can cause transmural inflammation, mm -hmm. um, severe inflammation. Um, one patient um, that uh, we did together where the patient had multiple episodes of RFA with Ken Cheng and we underwent laparoscopic hydrogen, essentially c -tiff. Um, essentially, the plane is obliterated. I would say that uh, technically, it actually increased the operative time by double. Uh, it is a very complicated. Uh, we worry about esophageal injury uh, in those kind of cases. Um, it, uh, there is really no plane. So I think uh, the notion that RFA is only mucosal uh, inflammation only is probably not true. It actually is a transmural inflammation and there is a consequence uh, when you do um, hiatal hernia repair after a patient who underwent RFA, which is technically much more difficult. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, so um, next question is from Joseph Shami. What's your thoughts, experience on TIFF following POEM? Yeah, so TIFF following POEM uh, is, is uh, uh, seems to be working well and could be um, the salvage that we've been looking for. Uh, if you look at uh, the approach to achalasia, Heller plus partial fundal plication versus POEM, uh, POEM seems to be as good, if not better, in terms of dysphagia relief, but POEM is more gertogenic than a combination of Heller plus, plus partial fundo. So if we, if by doing the POEM, uh, if a lot of folks after POEM get bad GERD and we need to send to the surgeons for a fundo, then they might as well do the Heller and fundo. Uh, but uh, now we're seeing that TIF in, in the 10% of patients after POEM who uh, are not responding to PPIs and they need an additional uh, procedure, we're offering TIF. And in the vast majority of those patients, TIF alone is sufficient. Uh, to control the reflux. So we're finding that TIF is really uh, a great salvage for post-POEM GERD. Ken, what are your thoughts on the safety profile? Because right now you're doing a TIF on mucosal apposition uh, alone because the, the muscular appropriate has already been taken down. Uh, is there any risk for higher injury? If we did it simultaneously on the same procedure, uh, we want to be extremely mindful of the fact that we just split the muscle already. And in the few cases where we've done it simultaneously, uh, we are we uh, we place the twelve o'clock position at the myotomy and avoid rotating or grabbing that part of the G junction. But the vast majority of the time, we're doing this months later. Uh, so there's, there's healing, there's repair, and we don't find it's more difficult. We actually find it's a lot easier in patients with achalasia because they already have a redundant esophagus, tortuous, and we, and we can, uh, there's a lot of length that we can bring down. And creating that additional intra-abdominal length can also straighten the esophagus and maybe even help their dysphagia. I'm assuming these patients you're doing is without a hate or a component to it. Right. Correct? Yeah, no, because I, we, we did today. I mean, today we did a laparoscopic heller myotomy with a hiatal hernia repair in combination with a toupee fund application. So certainly, if you have a hiatal component of it, I think surgical approach might be a better option. Yeah, so the achalasia patients with a hernia is relatively low, but we, we do have those. And in those patients, yeah, TIF would not take care of that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the TIF after POEM is currently off label right now, though, right? Is, is that correct? Uh, I, I don't know if it's a specific indication. It's not contraindicated. So. Right. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is um, from Mandeep142. Is it doable to do this in a routine practice? What is the learning curve for practicing GI and what type of credentialing is required to do 
uh, the TIF procedure? Yeah, I think the, the learning curve is quite variable. Mine was extremely slow because I'm kind of slow. <laughs> but, um, it took me a while because I did it, I started almost 10 years ago uh, where the equipment wasn't optimized and we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't understand the anatomy. Uh, but now as I'm uh, providing with these workshops on a, every, every two to three month basis and following the, the folks who got trained with us, the uptake is pretty quick. Uh, they come to a, an intensive workshop and they're doing these procedures. They're, they're being uh, supported um, for, I would say, the first you know, 10 plus cases and they're, get, they're getting more and more comfortable. So this is something, unlike EUS, where you can't go to a workshop and start doing them you know, with any kind of mastery. Uh, here you can take a workshop, get support for the first dozen cases, and then feel comfortable. I would say after your 20th case, you, you feel like you're, you've got a good handle, but we're still learning after hundreds of cases, so. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, another question from Mark Markian Kuziak. Oh, uh, let me answer oh, the yes. uh, privileging. So we do, oh, yes, have, sorry. Uh, we do have a standalone privilege, privileging for endoscopic fund application. Okay. Uh, so that is, so I, I would, recommend that. I, I, I don't think this fits in with any of our existing endoscopic privileges. Uh, so it is a standalone. Uh, so it requires, you know, proof of training and then uh, appropriate practice ship. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's the next question. In our experience using TIF or valve reconstruction, our patients are experiencing more substernal post-operative pain that than that of other methods, i.e. Nissen or Lynx. Uh, what is your experience? Substernal pain? Correct. Okay. I, you, we, we don't, we're not, I haven't been experiencing that. Nin, have you seen a lot of substernal pain after CTIF? Uh, no, not commonly, no. Well, they, yeah. They're not saying um, concomitant either, I, so I don't know if they're just speaking of just TIF or or a concomitant procedure. So okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not. I haven't been seeing it with TIF alone. Okay. And, uh, Nin sees them like one week after C TIF, and I see them one month after C TIF, and we're not seeing that. Okay. Um, Perfect. Next question is from Dr. Uh, Jatinder Pruthi. Hi, Dr. Chang, and hi, Dr. Chang. Now you have done quite a few TIF procedures. Did you have to revise to add more fasteners in any patients who had a partial response? Yeah, I would say maybe a handful of folks who maybe I've done three to five years ago uh, who had a nice initial response and then uh, you know would would have some uh, some breakthrough more than prior. And I'll look in and I can see opportunities to, to add more fasteners. Uh, the nice thing is unlike a Nissen redo, we don't have to take anything down uh, before we, we add more. Uh, with a Nissen, you've got to take everything down and then rewrap. Here we just add. We just see what's there, see is it posterior that loose, is it anterior that loose, and then just continue on from there. Um, and as our te technique is also refined, now we're approaching a little bit different than we did five years ago. So we're able to add more and also we're, we're also more experienced. Okay. So Ken, uh, just, um, just to add on that note is that what are your thoughts about, you know, people like John Lipham who thinks that all good patient has some type of a cruel defect associated with it? And particularly the one severe GERD and pathologic reflux. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And that these patients with TIF coming back, likely they have a cruel defect associated with that. I, I, I really actually embrace that. Um, after many years of experience, the, the TIF failures have almost always been the cura failure. Uh, either we didn't bl blow enough CO2 and we underestimated or, or we didn't appreciate it. And then when we reevaluate endoscopically, we say, oh, okay, you know, there's the Cura impression. It's a Hill 3, you know, either they developed it or we didn't recognize it. Most likely it's the latter. 
Um, and, and so we're more likely to go to, to a CTIF after that. Um, so the, the notion of any GERD patient, uh, by definition, has a curl defect, I'm not so sure that that's crazy or incorrect. Um, I, I still believe there's a spectrum. I still feel that there are patients who will respond very nicely just to a valve repair. Um, but the notion that that cura is already not working, uh, I'm, uh, it's probably not far from the truth. Uh, I'm not sure that I would, I'd be ready to, to subject every single GERD patient to an operation. Uh, because the, the data shows that if you pick the right patient for endoscopic alone, you'll get good results. And GERD is a chronic condition. It's not a it's not a one one fix condition. It's a chronic condition that needs to be managed uh, and navigated. Um, so I I still would uh, lean towards really profiling the patient and, and fixing what we know, and, and not over fixing. Um, so that's kind of my feeling. Um, I hope you guys are okay. There's just a couple more questions. I just want to try and get through all of these. So hopefully that, that's okay with your time. Um, the next question is from Seth and Katie Miller. Thoughts on use of endoflip rather than high resolution manometry? So Nan, I'm going to throw that to you, uh, you know, because you used to, you know, complain to me bitterly that, you know, you're trying to get the workup done and our manos are slow and why can't I do it all at once? And now we're doing EGD, Bravo, EndoFlip uh, as a pre hiatal workup. Um, do you think that EndoFlip uh, serves the purpose for your preoperative uh, workup uh, in terms of ruling out significant EGJ outflow, such as achalasia and so on? Or do you, do you really want a mano on every patient? No, I don't want a mano on every patient. So I think it's reasonable um, with regarding to your approach and actually facilitate and patient likes it. Uh, it does make sense, but there's certainly certain patients that have uh, atypical symptom that we do require in the manometry. You know, so uh, these kind of patients, we, we would uh, elect to add additional metric uh, evaluation on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so and I would also say that you know, uh, patients that we've interviewed over the years, and, and, and we say, what was the worst part of your experience from the workup all the way through the surgery? Almost always, they're going to point to the manometry as the worst part of their experience. So, and and I think we do a lot of uh, non-fruitful manometries. I think. Uh, I think endoflip is very good at ruling out EGJ outflow obstruction and achalasia. And if we think about the fact that, you know, ineffective esophageal peristalsis is not a showstopper at all for TIF or CTIF, then maybe that's sufficient. Okay. Here's another question from Dr. Admit Sahajia. During manometry, if I find an EG junction outflow obstruction, and the patient doesn't have dysphagia, can this patient go for anti-reflux surgery? The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Likely the outflow obstruction associated with a hiatal hernia. So you got to be very careful about that findings right there. Okay. Likely that's related to the hiatal hernia defect uh, itself. Uh, and all you need to do is re repair the hiatal hernia and, and the dysphagia symptom will improve. Um, okay. Perfect. I, yeah, I, I may add a time barrier mesophagram just to be sure that physiologically things are flowing nicely. Okay. Uh, next question is from Ed Belkin. Hi, how do patients with non gastric reflux respond to this? To the tip, I'm assuming. I'm, I think it may, uh, uh, the question is non-acid reflux. Uh, yeah, yeah, they said non-gastric reflux, so probably yeah. acid reflux. Yeah, okay. yeah, I, it works well because uh, it's 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 a structural defect. Uh, PPIs work only on the acid component and and not the mechanical uh, splashing of the gastric content. So, acid reflux, non-acid reflux should respond very well with with 
TIFF, C TIFF. Perfect. Uh, we have an ENT that's asking a question, Yvonne Richardson. She said, ENT here, is there any experience with TIFF in LPR patients with globus, throat clearing, dry cough who respond to PPI and diet uh, modifications but have a negative workup for GERD? Well, we could spend an hour on that question, <laughs> literally an hour on LPR. Uh, the, yeah, the short answer is, well, I don't know if there's a short answer. But, uh, <laughs> if, they're, if they're PPI responsive but workup negative, uh, I would be careful uh, before doing any uh, anti-reflux surgery, um, something like, Strata may be okay because not so invasive. Uh, I would look for uh, an inlet patch because sometimes that can give you that exact scenario. PPI responsive, but GERD workup negative, and we, we're doing more and more inlet patch ablation in those scenarios. But uh, yeah, you know, because there's the whole reflux uh, school and there's the reflex school. And the neuromodulators and so on can be effective. The raise of, uh, the band can also be effective for LPR. So I would be very careful before doing an anti-reflux operation in a patient like that. Okay. okay. Next question is from Sean Daly. Great talk, Dr. Chang and Dr. Nguyen. Knowing hiatal hernia are routinely larger than expected, should the two centimeter threshold for standalone TIF be eliminated and C TIF recommended for all patients with any suggestion of a hiatal hernia? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Million dollar question. Yes. <laughs> you want to take that, Nin? <laughs> I think so. I, I think any suggestion of a hiatal hernia, I think you're going to have a crural defect. I think I, I think that needs to be repaired. Um, uh, and the problem is that we have many cases, um, anecdotal cases already with myself and Ken Cheng, where literally it is a one centimeter hydro. You name it, okay? It, it, it's a hill grade two. And then when we go in there and, and after evaluation, our laparoscopic view doesn't really correlate. And that's where my perplex is is that there is something discrepancy with regarding to both upper GI and the endoscopic evaluation where these hiatal hernia are really under-recognized and under-appreciated. So, you know, there is no concordance between right now the endoscopic view and the laparoscopic view. Um, as you, I, I show you some of, of those pictures that, you know, we shared previously, um, it's not an uncommon scenario. How's that? Yeah, I, 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 I would add to that. Uh, and over time, uh, you know, my needle is also moving in, in, in a certain direction. Um, you know, we'll evaluate the patient. And even if anatomically it looks like a hill grade two and a one, two centimeter hiatal hernia, but their acid exposure time is 25%. Their Demisa score is 50. They, they have Barrett's. They, they had... Um, uh, LACD esophagitis that healed, I'm not going to believe my anatomy. <laughs> I'm going to do the CTIF, right? Because they've clearly got severe GERD and um, their occur needs to be repaired. So I, I think I think it's it's really considering the entire picture, including the anatomy. So um, Ken, let me ask you a question about that because you said that, you know, for these patients with severe reflux, esophagitis and everything, you want a relatively good anti-reflux operation. So when I perform a hiatal repair, I really increase the intra-abdominal length. And hence, you are able to create a longer valve. And you can actually see that. And you show the picture of that much longer than you would otherwise by yourself doing a TIF alone. So the question is that does that contribute to the improved efficacy? What are your thoughts? So you're actually helping me build a better valve. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but that's what I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly the, the valve is a lot easier once you've freed everything up and I can, you know, retract nicely. Uh, and, the, and the valves look uh, 
very nice. I mean, it's almost predictable. You know, the valve will look exactly like the the the, the valve from yesterday and the day before. So, I, I do think that mobilizing everything optimizes the TIF uh, and optimizes the efficacy of the TIF. Um, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so. You guys, when you guys are talking about this, it's great because you guys are showing the collaborative approach to treating reflux, not just looking at one or the other. So it's really, it's really nice to hear. Um, so the next question is from Dr. Dan Para. Thanks, Dr. Nguyen and Chang. Thoughts on TIF pre gastric sleeve? I've tried post sleeve and not technically possible. I don't know if that was a question. I don't think you should be doing TIF post sleeve. Technically, it's very difficult mm -hmm. now that we actually reset the gastric fundus. And remember, we go relatively close. So I think, first of all, I, I don't think there's an indication there for TIF post sleeve. Okay, so uh, I would not even try that. Um, but there, I think it's worthwhile to you know uh, evaluate this before uh, before sleeve gastrectomy. So meaning doing this as a stage procedure. So evaluate the patient for both morbid obesity and gastroesophageal reflux. A lot of us currently, what we're doing is that, hey, if you have severe reflux, you have bare esophagus, we will do a root wide gastric bypass. But I can tell you that root wide gastric bypass is a very good operation. I have no issue with that. But I'll tell you that the long-term side effects of it could be bad for the patient. Marginal ulceration, chronic abdominal pain, the risk of internal herniation. Anytime you have abdominal pain after root wide gastric bypass, you wonder and ponder in your mind, do I have an internal hernia? So they do get scared of that. So I think we should provide an alternative for management of reflux and getting a sleeve gastrectomy. So I think we were actually evaluating that. And one of the, the approaches really do a stepwise approach, take care of the reflux first, Okay, it might be hydrohern repair in combination with TIF to follow that by a operation to treat your morbid obesity. That's a sleep gastrectomy. Yeah, I I, I agree. Um, doing it pre is great, uh, but if in your, you you are in the situation post sleeve, if the patient has regained weight, uh, doing a revision gastric bypass is an option. Look, I'm talking to the past president of ASMBS, but what do I know? Um, so, so that's one option. But endoscopically, we do have some some solutions with the Apollo overstitch. We can do what's called the wrap procedure. We do a mucosal resection and then uh, suture at the muscle at the G junction, creating a gastrogastric plication that may help these folks. Uh, I think those are the sometimes. We can get away with a TIF uh, if we can retroflex. We've done that in a handful of post-gastric bypass. Uh, the pouch is large enough to retroflex to do the TIF. But again, it's much more, uh, it's a better strategy to do all that up front. So just to add on that, Ken, I think it's very, you know, careful that the gastroenterologists have to evaluate the anatomy of the sleeve before even do any of the operation that you mentioned. Many of the reflux episode after sleep is related to some type of distal obstruction and likely it's at the area of the gastric incisura. So the endoflip comes into play. This is where the endoflip really help us out. I would put the balloon all the way from the antrum up to the level of the G junction and evaluate that area for outflow obstruction. Okay, mm. so that's critical because if you have an outflow obstruction, I don't care what you do. I don't, the wrap procedure, anything you do at the G junction is not going to work. The only operation that's going to work for that patient is a conversion to a room wide gastric bypass. So prior to doing any procedure like that, you have to evaluate. And a lot of the, the, the endoscopy report I get from the gastroenterologist, hey, it looks great. I was able to put my scope all the way down. But they forget to mention that, hey, to get down to the antrum, you actually have to move left and turn the scope to the right. I'm sorry, but that's not a normal anatomy post sleeve. You should not have that partial obstruction where we call it an angulation issue where the scope had to go left 
and then make a sharp turn to the right to get down to the antrum. And that's notoriously, it's an outflow obstruction and has to be relieved by conversion to a ruined white gastric bypass. That's your upside down Christmas tree. That's correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. So I have a question, actually two questions from the same physician, Dr. Ferris Murad. He's saying, great talks, Dr. Chang, Dr. Nguyen. Um, as obesity is so prevalent, do you try to get patients to lose weight before TIF or CTIF? Um, do obese patients all get CTIF as a hiatal hernia, usually larger than expected? That's the first question. The second part is that he has partnered with a surgeon at a different hospital. Uh, do you anticipate any problems if the hernia is repaired first and then the TIF is done a few weeks later since they can't do the CTIF on the same day? So I know that was kind of a, a lot, but uh, maybe break it down in a yeah. yeah. So I think the first one is underappreciated the hiatal hernia. I think we kind of talked about that already. The answer is yes. It's really underappreciated. Um, I think what he's alluding to also, one of the questions is about a stage procedure. So let's do the hiatal hernia first to follow by a TIF procedure. I am not sure about that, to tell you the truth. I mean, I, I think it's a safer approach if you do like that, right? Because, you know, uh, you have time for healing to occur and everything like that. But I, I think in experienced hands, and that's why the caveat I mentioned is that Ken Chang came into this past his learning curve. So I, I have to give you that caution. You, you should not be jumping into CTIP automatically here. I think you have to have some tip under your belt trying to just jump in into the CTIP here. Um, you have to play it safe. But from a patient standpoint, I can tell you that no patient is going to want to have a stage procedure. They want to get the entire thing done in one hospitalization and go home from there. Ken, what are your thoughts? Do they, you think they like the stage procedure? Uh, no, no one likes the stage. No, procedure. I don't think so. But there are situations where we've uh, had no choice. You know, you've, you've done a few cases where you had to take a links out and, 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 and fix the hernia and we don't want to do them together, and so we stage it at that point. And 50-50 chance that they may be fine with just the hernia repair, right? So then we may avoid a second procedure. Well, you know, we also have a partial or, you know, total funnelification also, right? So, I mean, those are all, you know, our option, okay? Yep. So when we can't do it, this, you know, together because of a risk profile, I would, I always offer the patient, to do a conventional operation, yep, and this is publication. Absolutely, wrong Absolutely. with that operation. Absolutely, yep. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, next question is from Abdallah Kobesi. Thank you, Doctors Ching and Doctor Nguyen, for this great talk. What is your opinion or experience about the outcome of TIF on esophageal SXS cough and esophageal hypersensitivity? maybe it's extra esophageal uh, symptoms of GERD. Uh, yeah, so uh, all, the, all the level one uh, evidence uh, shows that it is effective. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing, uh, extra esophageal symptoms are harder to treat than esophageal symptoms, no matter what you treat. But uh, TIF alone and in combination has been shown to be quite effective for both esophageal and extra esophageal symptoms. Uh, now, when we get into hypersensitive esophagus, those are tricky waters because I would not want to do an anti-reflux procedure or surgery in a hypersensitive patient uh, because there they they don't have uh, abnormal pathologic acid exposure. It's it's a sensitivity issue. They respond often to neuromodulators, and I would definitely go that route first. But what, they, what if they have documented pathologic reflux based on your Bravo study in combination with some type of high, uh, esophageal hypersensitivity? What, what are your thoughts? Right. So then the question is, do you put them on Neurontin first and see what happens? Or do you treat the GERD and see what's left? Uh, it, it really depends if they have esophagitis, if there's Barrett's, um, and a discussion with the patient in terms of you know, going one route or the other. Okay. So we've got just three more questions and then we'll, we'll kind of uh, sh shut it down if you will. <laughs> um, Dr. Para, 
uh, has two questions, but I'll combine them. So um, are you doing these CTIF and TIFs as outpatients? I have some experience with this and it seems routinely feasible for most patients. And then he also wants to know what suture materials does Dr. Nguyen use to close the crua? The suture material is called Surgidac. It's 2 Surgidac. That's what I use. Okay. And um, for the CTIF, it's a 23-hour stay. That's what it is. So they stay overnight right now. We routinely perform an upper GI the next day. I just want to evaluate this. I want to get a good understanding. So literally, everybody has an upper GI pre-op and post-op. And, and that's why I can able to show you what the valve looks like. And we've been learning a lot about this. You know, are we making the valve too tight? Uh, are we getting adequate intra-abdominal length? It's all based on the upper GI assessment post CTIF. And we get that routinely in all patients. Okay. Yeah, for TIF alone, uh, it's variable. We, we have the ability of a prolonged extended recovery uh, in our unit. We can do two hours, four hours, eight hours, 12 hours because uh, we have our own overnight stay unit. Uh, typically, patients stay overnight, but sometimes uh, six hours post, if they're feeling great, we can you know, cut them loose. Uh, the, the main thing we're doing is uh, aggressive hydration to avoid post-procedure nausea and vomiting. We don't want them retching uh, with a newly created valve. And, and, I, and I tell patients, look, you may do fine. You may feel like you can go home, I don't want you to go home and, and tonight you're retching and I have to get you through the emergency room, especially with coronavirus. Um, and, and, and also, I, I don't want you to be tearing stuff. So we, we want to keep an eye on them. We want to give them fluid. Um, and, and it could be an, a, a prolonged stay. Uh, I know a lot of folks who just do the TIF and you know give them 500 cc's of, of saline and send them out. Uh, so it, it's quite variable. Okay. Uh, another question that just came up is, do you use mesh, Dr. Nguyen, um, and can it be applied too tight um, to cause dysphagia? Mm. Very good question. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. As you can see in that video, I use mesh. Um, it depends on the, the extent of the hiatal hernia defect. If it's relatively large, I use the mesh. Uh, it's a bioabsorbable mesh. But here's the uh, issue with the mesh. If you don't put the mesh correctly, when on an endoscopic view and you retroflex, you can actually see the mesh imprinted. So we learned that, you know, from the hard way when Ken Chang, you know, put the scope down, evaluate. So every time I finish a hiato, I assess that endoscopically. I evaluate for the hill grade. And one of the cases whereby you literally saw an imprint of the mesh pushing in because it wasn't lying flat against the diaphragm. So we had to go back and actually reposition that mesh. So if you're gonna put mesh in, which I think is fine, um, then if, if that's the case, you gotta pay attention. Sometimes you do have to take down that short gastric vessel. So this way the, the mesh slide completely flat against the crura and it doesn't cause an imprint onto the gastric. Uh, lumen, therefore complicating what Ken Chang is about to do. Okay. Uh, we have another question from uh, Dr. Mimi Canto. Uh, what are the barriers for surgeons to learn TIF and do more CTIF routinely? That's for you, Nin. <laughs> He's looking at me like... <laughs> well, what was the question again? Sorry. What are the barriers for surgeons uh, to learn TIF and do more CTIF routinely? Uh, I would say the main barrier is that the surgeon is going to ask, why should I be doing this combination approach when I can just do, a lot of people now like a partial fundification, and I get it, okay? And, and we can have this argument all day long. Should we do a lap hiatal versus, you know, in combination with Nissen or partial versus a CTIF? But I think, you know, based on my presentation, I would say you got to look at the big picture, who you're trying to help. It's all about the patient. I think at, at the end of the day, it's all about the patient. If, you, if we as a group and, and really develop this entire area of management of reflux and to say, hey, what is the best procedure for reflux um, and how we get that to the patient? 
Okay, if truly that, that that's our goal, and and our goal is to increase the penetrance, I think that's how you have to look at it. Um, so working collaboratively is much better than working in silo. That's what I would say. Perfect. Nin, Nin uh, uh, you know, I would imagine that a surgeon like yourself may be threatened by an interventional endoscopist like me getting into the GERD space. Um, am I taking your business? And actually, for me, it's actually reversed. That's why I put that slide up there for, called transition to practice. My practice was primarily these giant hiatal. And I'll tell you, and I always ask the question to the patient, I said, well, why didn't you come to see me earlier? Why do you come and see me now? Because my gastroenterologist tell me, don't worry about that hiatal. And I said, your entire stomach is in your chest. Uh, how is that not to worry? And the patient says, well, I've been counseled that if it's not broken, don't fix it. And if you're feeling okay, don't worry about it. And, and, and we see this a lot. So I would say, I think this is where the collaboration occurs, okay? Uh, right. The collaboration is that, you know what? We, have, we should have algorithm for management of all kinds of patients, including hiatal patients. When you pull the trigger and, and actually refer that patient to a surgeon, okay? And then working collaboratively says, you know what? What is the best interest for our patient? for this condition? Is it really to maintain the patient on PPI forever and, and, and all these associated side effects? I think that's what we have to ask ourselves. A gastroenterologist and a surgeon sit down and says, you know what, if truly that's our goal, the primary goal is to get the best treatment for the patient, how do we do it? And if it's truly the collaborative way, meaning the CTIP, then that's how we do it. Perfect, well, gosh. That's the end of our questions, and I feel like that was probably the, the perfect end to this whole uh, conversation today. Um, again, I can't thank both of you guys enough um, for your time today, tonight. Um, the, we had a lot of viewers watching tonight, so thank you, and thank you to everybody watching, and thank you for your questions. If we didn't answer your question, we'll, we'll email you or try to get an answer for you. Um, again, Thank you so much, Dr. Chang, Dr. Nguyen, for your time. Do you have any final thoughts before uh, we call it a night? Stay safe. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Stay safe. And, you know, on a serious note, I think this is a really trying time. I think all of us have to stay together and support each other. Um, I think a lot of us um, are, are, are really struggling through this whole pandemic and it, it takes a, an emotional toll, but it's also take a uh, psychological toll on us. So I think we need to rely on each other. We are like an entire group of family here. So I think you have to reach out uh, to communicate with others and, and really to fight against this infection and really thrive after everything's said and done. Right. Couldn't have said it better. Thank you again so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. And thank you again, doctors, for, for uh, your presentations and sharing um, your successes with the TIF procedure. Uh, thank you. And uh, catch us next time on our next TIF Talk Physician Edition. We will be sending out some uh, invites to that, to that next one. So thank you and have a very good evening. Stay good safe. Night. Bye. Bye-bye.